welcome to Things Are Getting Strange in Exiles We Watch podcast. I'm Nick. And I'm Kim. And as usual, we're news-free era of the X-Files again. Speak for yourself. Oh, you have something, do you? Yeah. It was actually a curio that I saw last week. Oh. Again, posted on Twitter by the X-Files Preservation Centre. Okay. Yeah, uh, I don't know the entire context of it, and there's been a lot of speculation about it, but it was a concept board for an X-Files-themed amusement park. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can I can almost see this, but not quite. Yeah, I did hear um, some people tied in. Apparently, uh, about a decade ago, there were some plans to make a kind of 20th century Fox amusement park in Dubai that I guess would have been like an equivalent of like Warner Brothers Studios or uh, Universal. Yeah, okay. So people are wondering if this X-Files exhibit was going to be like a part of that. Okay. But yeah, the curious thing about it, um, I did post a picture of it on the Twitter this week if you want to kind of check it out. But it's basically the schematic that looks like one big central area, which has such labelled things on it as like an alien autopsy area and things, with a number of oddly shaped rooms going off it, which each seem to be themed by a different episode. Okay. Want to guess what made the cut? I imagine you're going to just, whatever I say, I'm going to be wrong. I just know it. So this is again. This has either got to be painfully obvious or willfully obtuse. Uh the latter. Yeah, I figured. Okay, surprise me. Go on. What 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 ridiculous choices have we got? Okay, starting with the more normal. Yeah. Colony. See, colony would be one. It makes sense. I mean, you could do something with the submarine. You could do something with some of the weird set pieces, a people in tanks kind of thing. The host. Yeah, it's got a grisly sideshow kind of feel to it. Seven three one. The alien conspiracy again? Yeah, I mean trains. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This isn't that bad. Elegy. What? And Lazarus. What? Elegy. Lazarus. What? Elegy. So was Elegy just a? Was it? Was it a bowling alley? Was it a convalescent home? And Lazarus. Is it a bank? <laughs> what? Who chose these? Again, this kind of singular blueprint was printed without kind of frame of reference, so we don't know exactly what these theme rooms were envisioned to be. Yeah, but I can't envision anything for Lazarus. Most people don't remember Lazarus even happened. But yeah, uh, if you want to have a look at the schematic yourself, um, do check out, I posted it, or oh, at the time of airing this, it'll be, have been about um, two weeks ago, over on our Against Strange 42 Twitter. You can also find it on the X-Files Museum's main page, which is at X-Files Museum on Twitter. I'm still just floored by Elegy and, and Lazarus, of, of all the things you could have chosen. Yeah, I guess we'll just never know what this kind of idea for an X-Files theme park was anything to do with. Yeah, I mean, you could have coprophages. <laughs> you could have Jose Chung. I'm sure you could have some wild stuff for Jose Chung. I imagine Jose Chung as being uh, more of a kind of one of these static rides, you know, like the Ratatouille ride at Disneyland. Yeah. Where you're going through these weird and wacky tableaus. Yeah. Or, or hear me out here, you theme the eating area around the diner. Yeah, true. Which we found out is actually a real place. Yes, you it can is. Visit it's it. in Vancouver. So I suppose that will be our news for it is, yeah, you can, if you want to go and recreate eating sweet potato pie in a diner in Vancouver, you absolutely can. I understand from visiting their website that um, it's actually a very popular filming location. I think they cited things like Supernatural as well. Uh, for the record, if you're looking for it, uh, it's in Vancouver. It's called the Ovaltine Cafe. And if we ever wind up in Vancouver somehow, we are absolutely going to go visit this. Absolutely. I hope they serve pie. Sweet potato pie, in fact. But I suppose in a frivolity, we have to go to, uh, where are we, Missouri? Mississippi, wasn't Mississippi. it? Mississippi, yes. M I W S I W S I W P I. Yes, I remember. <laughs> Damn you, Alvin and Chipmunks. So, Trevor, directed by Rob Bowman, written by Jim Gutteridge and Ken Haulu. I'm very sorry for mispronouncing that. First broadcast on the 11th of April, 1999. Guest stars John Deal as Wilson Pinker Rawls. Styled out, escaped from New York. Oh, cool. He's just a punk, so he's just in there somewhere, but. Mm. Falling Down, the Michael Douglas one, directed by Joel Schumacher of all people, which people actually quite like. Okay. Uh, Stargate. The film. Oh, the film. The film. Con Air. You've kind of seen a kind of a pattern start to emerge here. Pearl Harbor. Okay. 
Jurassic Park 3. All right. I believe he was best known for Miami Vice. Yes. I don't really mean to dismiss it, but it's the whole... I don't, <laughs> I'm sure I am just trying things. to fill in for you yeah, no, what you're best fine. known for. I did AR for Big Mike, didn't I? Yeah. Okay. We also have Catherine Dent, who played Jane Gurich. Hilariously, she was on Frasier. It's been the first time for a while. It has. She will also, we will also see her again, because she's going to be in The Lone Gunman. Oh, okay. Uh, we have the fantastically named Tuesday Night, played Jackie Gerwich. Uh, she was on Nightmare on Elm Street 4. Mm-hmm. Where's Kramer's New Nightmare? Where she played herself. Okay, yeah. Which makes sense again. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure we've watched this one, but I wouldn't like to pick it out of a lineup. Amityville Moon. I think that's Isn't the that second... werewolf one? That's the second werewolf one, I think. Mm. It's like, oh my god. <laughs> I've watched far too many Amityville films. You really have. <laughs> And my god, they all run the gamut from pretty good to, oh my god, is this like 25p budget? 25 cents, sorry. There's nothing wrong with Mount Misery Road. Well, yeah, if you want to watch a Zed Grey Blair Witch rip off, sure. <laughs> uh, but let's more so see, we have Frank Novak, who played Superintendent Raybert Fellows, who was in Seinfeld, Independence Day, and this one really took me by surprise, he's in Watchmen, as Henry Kissinger. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, great. And so when you get the kind of credits, like, what the hell? <laughs> I mean, okay, yes, I see what's happened here, but what? And the one I laughed at is David Bow, who played Robert Werther. This is crap boyfriend. Husband. Uh, husband. Well, I still wasn't clear if he was husband or not. I thought they were married. I think they were engaged, or she wanted to get engaged, because she oh, brought okay. the bridal magazine. Mm. I think it might be engaged, but not actually there yet. All right. His Wikipedia thing says he's best known for exactly the thing I thought we should know him for. Which is? UHF. He's his friend. Oh, he's his buddy. He yeah. is. Yeah, I can totally see that. Yeah, I've sort of, of course it's him. He doesn't have the shaggy hair and he's wearing glasses, but yeah, it's his friend Bob from UHF. He's also been in loads of other things, like A Few Good Men, which feels Fair kind enough. of bizarre. The Rock, The Cable Guy, Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. <laughs> Fair enough. Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Regrets, uh, House MD, and American Horror Story 1984. And last, and possibly least, but, you know, it bears mentioning because this was a whole, wait, wait, wait is Ed Corbin, who plays the uh, simply named Guard. So we've seen him in True Grit. Okay. Where he played, ready, Bear Man. Aww. And, and uh, I have to do it every time. Atlas Shrugged. You're finding a surprising number of those. I know, it's kind of disturbing, actually. Can you give us a synopsis for Trevor? I can. Inmates are made to prepare and fortify a prison farm for a series of devastating tornadoes which are due to pass within the next few hours. An argument breaks out between a Wilson Pinker Rawls and another inmate, causing Pinker to nail the other prisoner's hand to a wall. After being reported to the audience for the incident, Pinker is made to sit through the tornado in a tiny outdoor shack known as The Box. In the aftermath of the tornado, the prisoners and guards emerge from shelter to discover the shack has been totally destroyed. On reporting this to the warden, the guard finds the warden's body has been split in two around the waist and is propping his office door closed from the inside. Warden and Scully soon arrive to investigate. Scully performs an autopsy and concludes that the severing of the torso and severe burn marks could have been caused by the weather conditions at the time and a substantial amount of the torso is missing from the severing. She also speculates this could be spontaneous human combustion, much to Mulder's delight. Mulder investigates the warden's office and finds one of the walls has become extremely brittle and crumbles at the slightest touch. In Meridian, a woman named Jane Gerwich is disturbed when she watches a news report on Pinker's apparent death. Elsewhere, Pinker is revealed indeed to be alive, and after breaking into a store somehow to get clothes, he is confronted by a security guard and handcuffed to a pole. Pinker slips out of the handcuffs with ease and escapes in the security guard's car. When the agents arrive at the scene, Mulder inspects the handcuffs and finds they too have become brittle and easy to snap in half. Bo Merkel, an old friend of Pinker's, discovers Pinker Ransack in his house and demands to know information that Bo knows. Bo attempts to shoot Pinker, but the bullets pass right through him. In response, Pinker burns off Bo's face, killing him. Mulder later discovers that the bullets retrieved from the wall are brittle and crumble into dust when compressed. He muses that Pinker, after being struck by lightning, has developed the ability to pass through solid objects. Gully argues he cannot possibly defy the, defy the laws of chemistry. 
evidence leads the agents to try and track down June. Uh, simultaneously to this, Pinker accosts her sister Jackie. Mulder and Scully arrive at Jackie's house, and Jackie tells them about Pinker's ability to walk through walls. They discover that June has changed her last name to avoid Pinker. The agents find her living with her new boyfriend and convince her to go into witness protection. Fortunately, Pinker was hiding in the trunk of Mulder and Scully's car, and leaves a charred message in, on the wall of June's house reading, I want what's mine. The agents discover the writing stops at the edge of the glass of the mirror, and Mulder speculates this is due to it being an insulator preventing conduction of electricity, and repulses Pinker's abilities. Scully finds medical bills indicating that June had a C-section, and that Pinker is actually in search of his son, who is not yet met. June is placed in a motel by the Mississippi Highway Patrol, but Pinker soon finds her and kidnaps her, killing the trooper assigned to guard her. Pinker demands to know where his son is and what his name is, learning his child is called Trevor, and has been living with Jackie for the past several years. Pinker attempts to kidnap Trevor, but is confronted by Mulder who is armed with a shotgun loaded with rubber bullets. Pinker manages to evade Mulder and continues to chase after Trevor and Scully, who is trying to get him to safety, and quickly corners both. Scully, using Mulder's hypothesis about glass insulation, locks herself and Trevor inside a telephone booth. After failing to break through the telephone booth, Pinker sees his son trembling in fear. Realising that he does not want to scare his son anymore, Pinker decides to walk away. However, June runs him over with a car. He passes through the metal components of the car, but not its glass windshield, and is cut in half and killed as a result. June insists she had to do it or Pinker would have hurt Trevor. She asks what Pinker wanted, to which Mulder replies, maybe another chance. Thank you. Well, it's not the worst episode. I think that's the highest praise you've given for an episode this season. I liked Drive, and I liked one of the other ones. In terms of endearment, I thought this endearment was great. Oh, good, that's two of them. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I, I think some of the reviews said it was actually just, it's kind of a generic -y episode, isn't it? Yeah, I did think it's, some of the reviews just seemed inordinately harsh for this one. It got overwhelmingly negative reviews. Yeah, I don't think it deserves that. No, it's by no means, it's not even one of the worst episodes this season. No, I, I think, again, it has one of those things we actually quite like of... Modern Scully have to do actual detective work, like ring round hospitals and find medical records and sort of put things together. Yeah, and Mulder not hitting exactly on what's going on immediately as well. Yeah, and just Scully mentioning human spontaneous human combustion is amazing, really. I did feel that she could have possibly made reference to the fact that that's been a plot point in at least three other episodes. Yeah, and just kind of go, hey, remember that guy we met, that guy from England who could set the house on fire, Mulder. Remember when you were terrified of fire in that one episode with Phoebe Green? Not to mention that locked room one that is arguably even more similar where people were just disappearing in a pool of ash. Yes. Oh, that one example. I mean, yeah, they've they've had paranormal things before and the fact that Scully is willing to su suggest spontaneous human combustion kind of implies some progression of how she sees these things. But Mulder has apparently read the script and doesn't believe in spontaneous human combustion. Apparently, there was a deliberate attempt in this one to downplay the supernatural aspects, partially for budgetary reasons, but also partially because they wanted it to be more of an emotional piece rather than a supernatural one. Okay. Well, I mean, ultimately, the special effects are quick cutting rather than anything CGI. Yeah, there was in the original script a plan to have a scene where Mulder chased Rawls through a motel with Rawls kind of skipping between the walls between the rooms. Yeah. But it just proved to be uh, too expensive to film, so they wound up not doing that bit. I've suddenly got visions of... Do you remember the Levi advert where they sort of run through walls? Yeah, like and that And then they one. run up the tree. Mm -hmm. So I can see it like Rawls running through the wall and then Mulder has to like shoulder barge to get through the place he's just gone through. Yeah. So they went with, for this one anyway, uh, more kind of practical based effects. The one they were particularly proud of is that one right at the start in the kind of warden's office where Mulder kind of touches the wall and it crumbles away and just leaves this vague outline of a person. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a, a nicely vague impression. It's not the Looney Tunes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly but there was a comment exactly to that of we didn't want it to look like a Bugs Bunny outline. But at the same time, you can tell it's supposed to be a person. Yes. Oh, yeah, that, that all worked very well. And I think it's a good demonstration that you don't need a huge special effects budget to make these things work and Rolls is threatening all on his own. I mean, the, as a sort of 
actor who's doing really well to be not, I don't know, trying to be affable, but there's a palpable menace to him at literally all times. In part, um, I will get to the interesting motivation that Rob Bowman had in this. Okay. However, it's in part you don't know how much of what you know is rules is true because it's all come from Jackie. So if you believe Jackie on face level, he's an incredibly violent, unpredictable man. If that is the truth, it makes every scene he's in has this kind of air of menace to him, which I found especially the scene where he sits at the table and talks to Trevor is you're not quite sure if he's going to snap. Yeah. If he'd be violent to the child, if he'll be violent to either of the women in the room. And it's just such a tense scene that, in credit, is entirely carried because that actor is capable of this. Oh, yeah. He's doing it very well, I felt. Though that, I've realised that, I mean, you praise, you quite like the moment where he, she throws the soup at him and it goes straight through him. Yeah, I thought it's kind of cool. But then she beats him over the head with the pot and I'm, suddenly I'm going, wait, why does that work? Maybe it's because she took him by surprise. Maybe, well, I suppose that could be it. I did hear that as a goof, though, that I didn't notice in the episode, is when the soup goes through him, it goes through his clothing as well. Ah. And we see throughout the episode that he's got to be naked to shift. Yeah. The clothes just kind of still slam into walls. I've got to wonder if that's a kind of, uh, like, a, almost a Terminator reference. Because mm. that has the whole, you have to be naked to time travel. And yeah. It makes sense. Well, it's a bit wishy-washy, the science in this one, of somehow <laughs> yeah. something, something, tornado, something, phasing powers. But... It would make sense that it was just him that was affected and not his clothes in that case. Oh, yeah, I can see the logic there. But I mean, I could also see an alternate version of this where he he's had this ability for a long time, but there's basically nothing for him worth breaking out of. And all, all it was is that basically he says that you heard from a friend of a friend about Trevor's existence. Mm. And so you could do this kind of like how F. Masculada started with them breaking out of you just need to give him a, an impetus to leave the prison and then he will actually make use of this power rather than having the tornado cause it. Yeah. Because it is, it is what possibly one of the worst excuses for how someone's got an ability to date. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there's not even an attempt to make it make sense. <laughs> it's just, he was caught in a tornado and now he can walk through walls. Okay. Because of weird atmospheric conditions, because sh- <laughs> sure. It's like... I'm sure lots of, uh, well, not lots of, I'm sure there are other people who've been in hurricanes and somehow survived it. Tornadoes. Tornadoes, and not come out with this. The original script called for this to be in a normal prison, but they couldn't afford to secure that kind of size of set, yeah, which is okay. why they went for the penal farm. But at the same time, I think that kind of works better because you could imagine the farm being totaled by a tornado more readily than you could an actual secure prison block. Yeah, it had the right look to it as well, I think. Mm. And you could also. It gives them an excuse to be outside like that, putting wooden panels on it. Because if you've got a kind of brick and mortar structure, yeah, you're not going to do that. Well, and the box as well, just having the solitary confinement being a box in the yard. Yeah. Uh, and also we've got uh, another callous prison warden, which I think is a kind of a prerequisite for the job. Except in Arrested Development, where he's kind of a nice guy. But Yeah, you're on the Shawshank level of yeah. prison wardens. Oh, that I'm going to be absolutely brutal and um, play it being nice, but yeah, I'm going to put you into a situation where you're probably going to die. Not care. I don't want well, I don't like Mordor sort of skipping to conclusions because he does seem to come on to the whole destruction of carbon very easily. Yeah. But I do like the fact that he sort of asks for the rubber bullets because that's, I think that for a lot of people watching it, you go, well, Okay, to so use rubber bullets, and he does. Yeah, I think I said the same thing to you when yeah, we were so, watching. Oh no, yeah, he's got them. It's what he asked for in the last scene. Yeah, he's that, uh, that, a very nice pragmatic. Um, I like detail. when he uses them. The shock from Rawls as well, because we've seen the previous scene where somebody just shot regular bullets and it did nothing. Yeah, but Rawls evidently was completely not expecting the rubber bullets. Yeah, although at the same time, with the comment about the soup and the saucepan, that does kind of imply that if you snuck out up on him or use a sniper rifle, he's dead. Mm. which I, don't, I think the episode doesn't quite commit to either angle of that i think in part and it i can go on to if you want what the actual intention of the episode was because rules isn't as dangerous as you're expecting him to be yeah i, th- I think i'm interested in this oh i'm gonna say am i gonna say rob i've lost respect for you yeah Possibly, I think. I, I think my respect levels went down a bit when I read this comment. It's a shame he directs so many of those sodding episodes, isn't it? And the film. Yeah. Well, it all goes on the basis of who would you say is the villain in Trevor? My perspective, it would be this is a character thing where Pinker Rawls starts as the villain, 
and has his a start of redemption towards the end where he has realized that he's in the wrong he's terrifying his son he needs to change and yep. then he didn't get the opportunity and dies before he can i have a horrible feeling you're about to tell me that june is the villain june is the villain of the episode that's oh the God. intention of the episode yep Okay, I will read it out oh, verbatim for you, but this is a quote from Rob Bowman when asked about the nature of Pinker rules. Pinker is a crazed killer, but not a monster. I mean, in truth, the real villain of the piece is June, an upwardly mobile woman who basically sold out her boyfriend, then gave up her son so she would be more attractive as a single woman. I think that makes an interesting contrast to Pinker, a man who'd do anything to get out of prison and be with his son. Rob, I'm going to disagree with you here so on a lot of it points. It certainly doesn't come across in the episode, but June is supposed to be the villain. Sorry, she she wasn't meant to sell out her boyfriend and meant to live her kind of trailer park trash life. I And I get the whole... We don't know the circumstances of the adoption of the son either. It's also, again, I'm going to go with, we have no way of knowing if if June's claims about rules are true but she does tell a story about him driving 60 miles to beat a guy unconscious. Yeah. He's a violent man and she's clearly terrified of him. So we are kind of minimising her experience as an abused woman. Yeah. By saying, oh no, she should have remained loyal to him, apparently. Yeah. And also, I think there's also there's a lot of assumption about the maternal aspect of, you don't know that this pregnancy was unplanned or something, and Jackie had a conversation where Jackie can't have children. And that's why the son is now living with Jackie. But also, to all extents and purposes, Trevor appears to be very well cared for. Yeah. Both Jackie and June care for him because she's still in his life as Auntie June. Exactly. He's, he's not been abandoned by June. No. She is trying to keep this part of her life out of it, but is she not allowed to move on and not want to be stuck like this anymore? No, it's... Admittedly, she is a criminal. She stole this money that she knew it was a proceed of crime. Oh, yeah. And spent it on a better life and didn't tell her jerkbag fiancé about this yeah at all but <laughs> i mean it's one of those whole you don't want to have to explain this to someone and he could have handled it better i think if you, to make june more likable you would have had to have put her on the witness protection program or something so she hadn't disclosed this to him because she was under a new name because this was some kind of protection against pinker rolls yeah but, she, the, you know, that's not the way the episode has gone. It hasn't made June to be a perfect human. She is flawed. Yeah. But at the same time, I wouldn't call her the villain. No, I mean, again, this is... Rob, sorry, these are what we call complicated characters. <laughs> People have more and than again, one aspect her of actions at the end, Mulder rebukes her as having done the yeah, wrong that's... thing. But at the same time, again, if we are taking June's stories being accurate, she is reacting in a way to a man who was once violent towards her and she's afraid will be violent towards her biological son. Yeah which seems, again, legitimate threat. Yes, I mean, that explains why Maud's last line feels totally so off. We have seen in previous episodes, though, that Mulder is oddly not attuned to women's feelings. Yeah. I mean, see um, my much-hated Excelsior's Day. Yes. The one in which a woman is talking about being raped and Mulder completely dismisses her. Yeah, and just says, oh, she's delusional or it's a psychological effect. Yeah. Rather than the invisible man thing but then you can make a case for at least pinker had a realization at the end there and you can you can frame the ending as a tragedy for him in that he generally seems to understand that he can't behave as he has done and that his behavior up to this point has been isn't doing isn't well he's not helping this relationship he now wants he's desperate to have a relationship with his son but he realizes that behaving the way he has and yeah rolls is a murderer he's yeah. not a nice guy but when he sees that fear in the child's face, that's his kind of epitome. Exactly. And the fact that he is then killed before he has even a chance to work on this, yeah, that makes it a tragedy. Still doesn't make June the villain. No. Because everyone's been running away from Pinker Rolls. And let's not... Also, let's not mince words, is that Pinker has killed three people in basically cold blood. Three? There are two in the episode, aren't there? Three. There's the Warden... There's Bo, and then there's the guy in the motel with June. Oh, of course, yes, I yeah, forgot he about dies him. As well. so, yeah, not to mention the episode begins with him nailing another, uh, admittedly, a very annoying inmate's hand yeah. to the wall. But an annoying, is, <laughs> which also supports that what June is saying is the truth, because it's this sudden flash moment of extreme violence. Exactly, and while you 
I think you can make an argument for Bo because Bo did try to shoot him, although ultimately that didn't do anything. Mm. But And the warden did try to have him killed. And the warden did what? Not so much didn't have to have him killed, or basically didn't care if he lived or died, I think. But that's still... That's it's mid- still that's the cold-blooded, yeah. though, of Rawls could have just left. Yeah. That's splitting hairs. Mm. But yeah, he could have just left him in... Done this afterwards when there wasn't a risk of him dying. Yeah. And But the, the um, guy in the motel room is basically... You can't justify that one. He just did flat-out murder a guy. Yeah. And it's the fact that because of the nature of Rawls's powers, is these are really, really protracted, very gory deaths as yes, well. Um, this isn't a quick death. It's not like the finger snap, um, soft light death. No. They said that the death of the warden took 40 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> but that comes from a moment then does explain, which do make him affable. Like when the security guard gets him at the store, he's actually kind of a fun villain. It's just how he's at talking to him. That bit kind of reminded me a lot of Pusher. Yeah. Because it was just, he's not as cerebral as Pusher, but it's the idea of somebody who is so sure of their abilities that they know they're essentially invincible. Yeah. But then that would also, that also comes back to my thing about how he's, obviously no one likes being in prison, but he's got no reason to leave prison. Mm. And then you give him a reason to leave prison, so he does. Because there's no getting used to his powers bit for him in this episode he just can do it all immediately yeah because most people and most episodes would have a moment of you have to figure out the mechanics of what you can now do i don't think he understands his weakness until the bit with the mirror though no because you see from the way he's etched that kind of message on the wall and just suddenly stopped at the mirror kind of has the inference of he thought he could continue yeah but we still need a hot there's there needs a moment of how do you figure out you can do this which we've had in other episodes and we don't get in, there's a load of them that don't have the, sorry, and you figure out you could do this how? Mm. What led you to think this? Your kind of Ring of Gaiji's moment of, holy hell, I'm now invincible and I can do anything. Yes. And that moment's missing, and it's also kind of odd that that happened in the aftermath of a tornado. <laughs> After the warden came into his office in the morning, apparently, but before anyone looked at the surveyed the wreckage, and was the warden sleeping in his office? During a tornado. During a tornado, that's a bit weird. I think people normally go down to their basement or something like that, don't they? Yeah, if yeah, I mean, I've seen Twister. That's what they did in Twister. <laughs> like, living here in a country where tornadoes are exceptionally rare, this is our frame of reference. Well, that's yeah, true. I do remember one criticism of the episode, and I think it came from the EV Club, which I felt was really unfair, which was that the idea of Rawls having a son is kind of done as a surprise in the episode, but... You do spend, what, two-thirds of it before anyone explains who Trevor even is. I suppose X-Files has had titles that don't seem to really connect to the episodes before, but this feels a bit different because it's actually a name. Yeah, but my my point about that is, I don't know how anyone else experienced the X-Files, but when it was to look out on the BBC, you knew what time it was on, you didn't look at the listing because why bother, because you're going to watch the episode anyway. Yeah. So the title of the episode... I didn't know half of the title of the episodes because, unlike Star Trek, they don't put them on screen. Yeah, that's true. Unless you looked in the TV guide or something, you wouldn't know. So it feels a weird thing to critique the episode of that, you know, there's an open question in it, is that I'd watch most X-Files episodes completely cold and just wait for it to happen. Mm. But at the same time, even if you knew its name, I mean, knowing Tithonus's name doesn't tell you anything about the episode. No. And you can't conjecture the existence... Well, no, there's one shot I, I realised this time where you can conjecture that Trevor exists, but you it's so blink and miss it, you'd know, you can, probably can't notice. There is one moment where somebody asks Jackie about her son. There's that, but there's also, I thought as well, the fact that you see a toy police car on the, on the um, counter when yeah, P- P- Binker first comes in. And if you're not looking for it, you probably won't sort of put two and two together that she has a child. Yeah. Because that whole, their whole encounter is framed around you not noticing that one detail. I think I read the AV Club criticism of it as well. And I think she maybe inferred more than the average person would infer. Because her argument was hinging on the fact of, you know, he doesn't seem very money motivated. Therefore, there must be a son. And I'm not sure you can necessarily... I'm not sure you can necessarily make that kind of logical leap. No. It could be the whole, he doesn't seem very interested in the money. So there must be something more. The son just feels like a step further than that. At the same time, by the point the money has fallen away as a reason is when you get the explanation in. Because right the way up to the point where he's grabbed June, the idea he's coming for the money, there's nothing to dissuade you from that notion. 
his threat is always, I want what is mine. Yeah. It, which and, could be the money. Exactly. And it, that's why it's phrased like that. It's not, I want my son or something, which would be a lot shorter to write if he was going to just sort of actually say that. Then again, I suppose he doesn't know what his um, gender, his son, his um, child is. So I want my child would have worked as well. Yeah, no, that's true. I think one of the more fair reviews I saw, as always, was Paula Vitaris over at Cine Fantastique. And I'm starting to think that she and I are on the same wavelength, to be honest. Well, she, she does seem to have the, I don't know, most least fanish takes, most fair takes, I think. Yeah, I always, I always agree with her. Even if it's an episode I like that she's given a negative review, I always think her points are really valid. Yeah, you can understand where she's coming from, if not what she thinks. Her ratings are always out of four, and she gave this one two and a half for the record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she kind of, uh, as we said, she criticised the science between something, something, powers, something, tornado, <laughs> something. But uh, she also really praised the kind of idea behind the episode and the special effects, and particularly the fake corpses. Okay. You know, a- as usual with the X-Files, the dead bodies do look really striking and interesting. <laughs> it's a weird thing to have as a credit. Yeah, no gel nylons this time, but I think in particular, um, Bo's corpse with the face burnt off. Yeah, that's particularly grisly. Yeah, but it's also a kind of very striking and memorable effect. That's true. It's a very good episode that balances, I think, the Mulder and Scully scenes with the um, scenes of our one-shot characters very nicely. But the only character you've really talked about is June. Well, I th- I thought I talked about Pinker Rolls a fair bit. Yeah, what about the rest of the cast? You spent ages no, introducing them. Are you <laughs> going to actually talk about them? Well, okay, I mean, crap boyfriend, we can't do much other than he's just, well, he's unsupportive as hell. Yeah, June knows how to pick him, really. Yeah, I mean, it is the whole, I suppose, I think Rob Bowman's comments have just sort of ruined, that, ruined a lot of the episode now it's because he can't help but look at it and go, oh, wow, that's what you were going for. Well... The crap boyfriend doesn't seem to be as outwardly violent and monstrous as Pinker Rawls, but at the same time, oh, fair enough, he's been lied to and he's just discovered his fiance is a criminal. But at the same time, he drops her so fast. Yeah, it's it's that, oh, she's the one who's in danger, not me. Bye. And yeah. walks out the plot. <laughs> yeah, it's like, wow, so your relationship was based on sand? <laughs> all that love gone instantly. Yeah. No, no kind of conflicted emotion or anything like that. So I don't think there's much more to say about him other than he's just, um, well, a weird thing to be ticked off, really, isn't he? Despicable. But Jackie is a very good character. Jackie, okay, Jackie's more interesting. It's not clear how much history she actually has with Pinker Rolls either, because presumably she knows mostly via June. But they do know each other because they he recognises her and um, talks to her when he enters the house. Yeah. I mean, as we just speculated on a bit before of did she want to be a mother in a way that June didn't? And that's why Trevor is with her. She has stepped up and Trevor believes her to be his mother. Exactly. And as you said, though, it's not like June has sort of cut Trevor out of her life. It it does seem to be that she didn't want to be a mother, I mm. think, is what you can really take from it. Yeah. She had uh, other ambitions for life and she didn't want to be lumbered with a child. Particularly the child of a violent criminal. Yeah. And there's other things you can read into exactly how the C-section even happened via any other method of dealing with it. But Yeah. It's interesting, and it's something we've seen over a few episodes this season, is it's another episode that largely focuses on the monster of the week rather than Mulder and Scully. Because I think we possibly have more scenes with Rawls than we do with Mulder and Scully in this episode. Yeah, we're starting to get into this. We could do. We can really sort of push them into the background for some of these episodes. And I can see that the attempt with this one was, as you say, it's character study where we want to make a despicable man kind of sympathetic. But I think we had a kind of similar idea there with Terms of Endearment and that was a lot more effective. Yes, and I think it's the the contrast of Terms of Endearment helped a lot because, we, as we said, one of the darkest conceptual episodes you can possibly imagine and it's still watchable, which is... Terms of Endearment has been one of my favourite episodes this season so far and part of its strength is the fact that you wouldn't think you could feel sorry for Wayne, yes. and yet you do. Yes. I mean, and I think as well, it's, since both of them have their moment of revelation, sort of, not so much a sacrifice on Wayne's part, but it's kind of a revelation for Pinker, is, I think you pointed out that Wayne's is still 
it's very last minute kind of thing and it's not it's not redemptive at all it's just one the one nice thing he's ever done yeah whereas i could believe that pinker rolls is going to genuinely try to be a better person i mean he's going back to jail unfortunately although you're gonna put probably him in for room. life given yeah. that he's just murdered three people and he's gonna wind up in like the plastic prison they put magneto in in x-men 2 yeah. it's made of rubber it's like the only way you're gonna do this and then you know mystique is going to inject the guard with metal and wait, wait i'm what? envisioning that we're going to wind up getting our kind of x-files universe equivalent of tartarus where we've got all these special cells for all these different people in Mulder's court so you know the fire resistant one for cecil lively <laughs> and things like that dpo in his well insulated room yeah well that's a weird thing then because you can't have that because that's not how the fbi functions mm. had this been dark skies kind of mindset you absolutely could have done it yeah. I mean, they, they don't have it in dark skies but since this is the secret agency with all the power and the funding yeah you could have made tartarus and shoved everyone in it mm. and i'll be your whole well then <laughs> unfortunately then we're turning into a batman series where oh no Cecil Lively's escaped again. It's like, oh, for God's sake. The rotating door on Alchem Asylum. Yeah, it said, who walked in there with a bit of paper again? You jerks. <laughs> You're not allowed aftershave. We've been through this before. <laughs> and so on. We've got another thing for Scully's maternal instincts, which just seem to kick in almost at random. I mean, we'd made a big thing in <laughs> X-Files at first of... Scully was terrible with kids, and Mulder was great. Mm. And then somewhere uh, around season three or four, four probably, wherever home happened, yeah. and Scully first said she wanted to be a mother, we seem to be trying to push Scully as the one better with kids, and we do see that keep coming up, and Mulder just has no time for them anymore. Yeah. A really odd character direction for both of them to go in. But we've got it again here with Mulder has to shoot Pinker rolls while Scully has to run off with the children. And Scully quite cleverly does protect him as well. You know, taking him into the most convenient phone booth in the world <laughs> yeah. there. Just to, you know, making sure to shove him into a room that's full of glass, essentially. Yeah, although at the same time, that looks like Perspex. And I'm sure Perspex is an insulator to a point. I don't think it's as good as glass. It is an insulator, yeah. Okay. But then you sort of say, there's that great big metal panel with a phone's bolted on, and Pinker, do you want to go through that bit? Oh, it's when <laughs> you saw that, the shiny telephone boot for the Hope ahead yeah. of them. I just got the Simpsons scene stuck in my head with Nightboat, and there's always a fjord, <laughs> and that's all I could think of then. I awesome. even have it written in my notes here. Yeah, it's that phone booth is just there purely for the reason of they need somewhere insulated to run to. Yep. Wasn't there a um, potential goof with the... Um, how they kill Pinker Rolls in the end. Oh, the car. Um, Yeah. I, I don't know if this is entirely accurate or not, but I read a criticism of his death by car because the idea is that he's killed because he can pass through the bonnet and not the windscreen, yeah? Yeah. So he's kind of cut in half. But we've seen that Rawls changes the composition of things when he passes through them, which means the second he passed through that engine, the engine would have disintegrated because it's entirely made out of metal and therefore crumbled away and stopped working, and the car would have just kind of slid to a halt, and therefore it probably wouldn't have killed him. Uh, I think it depends on how fast he was going. Inertia might have still taken him out, or at least injured him. But the, at the same time, we know that this doesn't happen because Mulder turns the engine off. Yeah. I mean, you could go a bit further than that, and if you want to get into the nitty-gritty, engines aren't purely metal. There are There is there's some amount of rubber in there. There'll be some wiring, because you have to coat um, electric cables with stuff to make sure they don't spark but at the same time this isn't going to be a solid thing that would cut through them, i imagine if you've got tubing and stuff in there it's going to just bend yes although again depending on speed again you come down a factor of speed because a lot of things if you throw something in it fast enough she doesn't really have much room to accelerate it can't be going that fast well i know <laughs> so I'd, I'd think she just sort of he might break a few ribs but otherwise be okay mm. I think it's we wrote ourselves into a corner kind of thing. It's a problem we've seen over the last few. Arcadia is another one similar, where the episode just kind of ends. I guess we ran out of time. Yeah, I could try it. I think I think that's the problem with the next episode too. But we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, okay. Do you want to move on to Milligro? Unless you have anything else for this one. No, no. I've made you talk about characters now. So let's talk about an episode with a. Far few, smaller cast, far less characters. Yes, I'm going to talk at length about these characters because I'm going to go, what? What? Milago then, directed by Kim Manners, 
Story by John Shaban and Frank Spotnitz. Teleplay by Chris Carter. First broadcast on the 18th of April 1999. Guest stars. John Hawkes plays Philip Paget, who is in Congo. Ah. From Dust Till Dawn. Rush Hour. I still know what you did last summer. Oh, yes, yeah, I recognise him. He is and I know what you did last summer. You are correct. He's, um, Freddy Prince Jr.'s friend. He dies towards the start of the film. Oh, okay. I, I do not <laughs> talk about believe you on that one. But then he's in S. Darko. Oh, gosh, S. Darko, the sequel. But he's also in three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Oh, I liked that film. He's also going to show up in Millennium, and he was in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Ah, oh, good career then. However, then we have Nesta Serrano, who played Ken Nascimento. He's the killer. He's the killer, and we'll get to that. <laughs> who is in Lethal Weapon 2. Okay. The Day After Tomorrow. Captain America Winter Soldier. Ah. Oh. Dexter. Ah. Oh. And last, we have Gillian Bach, who played Maggie, who is the girl on the date whose boyfriend got killed. Lover's Lane. Lover's yep. Lane. Was in American Pie. Oh, okay. So, would you like to tell us what happens in Milagro? Not really. <laughs> no, no, I don't think you would. Would you like to do some beat poetry about what happened in Milagro? Not really. Okay. No, I'll just skip this part. We can have a rest if you want. Just, just stop the podcast now. Yeah. No, no, I'll do it, I'll do it. I've lived a good life. Have you? No. <laughs> But anyway, as usual, ad-libbed from Wikipedia. Our episode opens this time as an author sits at his desk, suffering from writer's block. Much later into the episode, we learn that this author's name is actually Philip Paget. After procrastinating a little bit, he eventually retires to his bathroom to get rid of his cigarette, and without warning, suddenly reaches into his chest and pulls out his still-beating heart. Later, we see him walking down the stairs into a kind of furnace room in his apartment. He opens the door to the incinerator and sees a beating heart amongst the flames. He doesn't seem to be bothered at all by seeing this and instead just tosses away his garbage, which is comprises of a paper bag. I don't think we ever really learn what's in that bag, but you kind of make the assumption that this is him getting rid of the heart, I guess. Sure, why not? Later that day, Dana Scully encounters this same writer as she gets into the elevator in Mulder's apartment building. They both ride up in silence, as the stranger just kind of creepily scares at her, mildly freaking her out. As Scully knocks on the door of Mulder's apartment, we see that Philip Paget is actually his next-door neighbour. Mulder and Scully uh, sit in Mulder's apartment discussing a case they are working on, where the heart of a victim has been removed from his chest, but without any kind of physical evidence of injury or surgery. Mulder believes that this is because the killer is using a technique called psychic surgery. On the other side of the wall, Paget is standing on a chair with his ear to the air vent, listening to every word of their conversation. That night, two teenagers get into a fight while alone in the woods on a lover's lane. The girl runs away into the woods, leaving her boyfriend, Kevin, who gives chase. As he does so, he's attacked and his heart is removed by the mysterious killer. Throughout the scene, we cut to Paget, who is writing at his typewriter intensely. The following day, Mulder and Scully discuss the incident via phone while Scully is sitting in their office. She finds an unmarked envelope containing a milligro, a kind of religious charm that features an image of a burning heart. As she examines the pendant, we hear Paget in voiceover describing Scully's intimate feelings as she examines an unsolicited gift. While trying to figure out what the Milagro means, Scully visits a church where she meets Paget, who has quite obviously been following her. He tells her the story of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. He also reveals some oddly intimate information about her, and Scully leaves visibly upset. She meets with Mulder later and relays this encounter to him. Later that day, Paget somehow manages to seduce Scully into his apartment by revealing more of her surprisingly accurate character revelations. As he manages to get Scully into his bedroom, Mulder bursts in and arrests him on the basis of the fact that Paget's novel accurately describes the case they are working on. 
Paget is soon revealed to be innocent, despite the fact all evidence points towards him, as Maggie is murdered in the same fashion as Kevin while he's locked up. With no concrete evidence whatsoever, Paget is released in the hope that he leads them to his partner in crime. Mulder has figured out the fact that Paget and the killer are communicating in some way, he just can't figure out how. Back at his apartment, Paget has a long conversation with the killer from his book, a deceased Brazilian surgeon named Ken Nascimento. It is revealed that the two of them share some kind of a psychic connection. Nascimento was a real person, albeit now deceased, but he has been brought back to life and has been removing hearts on the whims of Paget. As Nascimento is just a character, he doesn't understand his own motivation for doing so. Throughout the scene, we see that Mulder is surveilling Paget. However, from Mulder's point of view, Paget is just sitting at his desk and there is no one else in the room. Paget and Nascimento discuss the motivations for the killings, and Paget realises that the only true way for his novel to end is with Scully's death. In a bid to prevent this, he heads to the incinerator to destroy his novel, but is interrupted by Mulder. Meanwhile, Nascimento does attack Scully and begins to remove her heart. Hearing gunshots from upstairs, Mulder runs to his apartment to find Scully on the ground and covered in blood. Fortunately, she's still alive. The episode closes with a final voiceover from Paget to explain his final actions. We see that he is lying on the basement floor in front of the incinerator, having destroyed his manuscript. However, his still beating heart is in his hands. The episode ends with saying he has given what he could not receive. Thank you. Sorry, I struggled to do that (laughs) objectively somewhat. You know what this reminds me of? Last episode of Game of Thrones. Why? You remember it got right to the end of the episode and Tyrion goes a gravely long speech about how great stories are and how great writers are. Yeah. This kind of feels like Chris Carter sort of complimenting himself. The writing team of the X-Files did consider this to be a very personal piece because it's inspired by how they feel as scriptwriters for the X-Files. There you have it. (laughs) It's apparently down to the fact that the layout of Paget's apartment, he's got that wall covered in the little flashcards, is that's how they plan X-Files scripts. Those flashcards were actually handwritten by Frank Spotnitz to make them look authentic. Okay. I mean, it feels very self-congratulatory, and it sounds like it was meant to be self-congratulatory. I think one of the key problems is that these guys aren't novelists, they're screenwriters. Mm. And none of Paget's text is acceptable. It's the purplest of purple prose. He's naturally an abysmal writer. Exactly. I mean, this is, a, this is what a screenwriter thinks a novelist does. It says one of those examples you hold up of, you can be great in one area, you can't necessarily jump to the other one. It mm. requires a completely different skill set. Some people can, a lot of people can't. You lot transparently cannot do this. Uh, so that does not help for at all, does it? You see this kind of concept of the author's work coming to life in fiction a lot. Most noticeably, we keep coming back to Stephen King, but the dark half, this is the entire point of it. The guy who the killer from his stories is coming to life and murdering people, and therefore it all looks like he's the guilty party. Yeah, I had a stupider comparison as well. Are you thinking Garth Marenghi? Because that's the other thing that pops into my head. You can. You certainly got Garth Marenghi. I've got e- even kind of... Garth Marenghi is knowingly silly this is a, a, a 90s comedy i was thinking it's one of garth Marenghi's recent books has the whole plot where he buys the cursed typewriter that he has a sexual relationship with and then his stories start coming to life and it's but every time i saw paget the typewriter unfortunately garth Marenghi has now ruined <laughs> this for me and if you'd like to see the uh <laughs> quite a, the terrible details of that relationship the book is called terror tome and uh, it's it's a hoot it's just brilliant, really. The one I was going for is a uh, John Candy film from the 90s called Delirious. Okay. And it kind of feels like that was what the episode could have been because he's a soap opera writer who's uh, afraid that he's being replaced by a different writer, gets into a car accident and basically falls unconscious, and then wakes up in the fictitious universe. So it's like an isekai. It's like an isekai. So he wakes up in the soap opera universe. And partway through, someone says something to him, or he realizes that. He can start writing the universe to correspond to what he wants to do. Oh, cool! So basically, he turns it into a self-insert thing where he's dating all the all the most beautiful women and everything, and you know he can drive a car really fast on a road blindfold kind of thing. Yeah, he does all that, and then he's going fine until something goes something he can't predict happens, and basically he gets really drunk, 
and wakes up the next morning, not sure what he typed. <laughs> and so then you get this really bizarre sequence where all logic starts breaking down as random people turn up and the revelations get even stranger than soap operas normally do. Okay. That sounds fun. Oh, I remember it being fun. I don't remember it actually being that good ultimately. So I can't say it's a recommendation. But in the next episode, though, you could have done that as a comedy because there's like so much scope there for someone altering reality, which is what we what we think Philip Padgett is doing. At the same time, we don't understand why he can do it. And if this is your altering of reality, this is terrible. Why would you do this? I mean, I was also said to you, this is like the worst guest villain we've ever had because the killer is barely in the episode. Mm. Like when he shows up at the end, he goes, who the hell is that? I do in part like the scene where him and Paget discuss his motivations, but it made me think a lot of the bit where Clyde Brookman meets the killer in Clyde Brookman's, and it's like, oh, why am I doing all this? Well, haven't you figured it out? You're a psychopath. Yeah, and Clyde Brookman knew what it was doing with that. Yeah. It put me in mind of Breakfast of Champions as well, because there's a, there's a part where one of the characters meets the author of the book. Oh, uh, Kilgore Trout meets the author, doesn't it? Yeah, Kilgore Trout meets Kurt Vonnegut, yeah. and it does not go how Vonnegut wants it to go, too much to his surprise. But, I mean, Clyde Brookman also had a point. I mean, actually, I did realise partway through this episode that we've got the same problem as the last Chris Carter episode, which was How the Ghost Stole Christmas, in that someone flat out says that Scully is lonely. Mm. That Chris, you've got to stop doing this. <laughs> yes, it's true, but you can't keep having people say that. I'm not sure the writers of The X-Files have ever actually spoken to a woman <laughs> on the basis of this episode, to be honest. Oh, well, yes, there's that too. It's uh, the bit where she seems to be vaguely turned on by an autopsy and stuff like that. Well, I'm turned on by an autopsy, turned on by the Milagro, and then we get the Scully cheesecake shots. Completely just everything is seductive or makes you flush unconditionally or something like that. It's just like every part of Scully's life is arousing in some way. Yeah. Well, this, this is the breasting boobly down the stairs, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> breasting boobly down the stairs, very much so. But it's also kind of on the basis of Scully just gets seduced by utter wankers, apparently. On the basis of you've got this and her very similar abrupt relationship with the psychopath in Never Again. Yep. Well, to be fair, Scully has two modes. It is psychopaths and it is the most boring people in existence. Because that guy from Lazarus was kind of tiresome before he got possessed. And her horrible, horrible date in Jersey Devil. Yep. I mean, again, we, we're going to come back to, and we're going to have to find the later scenes because I'm curious. The boyfriend we know is cut from Pilot. What was he like? I'm very curious now as to how did he factor into this um, grid of Scully relationships? Mm. Which one was he, which vector was he on? They can't just have a normal, like, Rita and Dexter, perfectly nice sort of relationship. No, but then I think we've, we keep invoking it. It's got to come back to it's the Avengers influence is the problem, is you can't let them have anything that will actually disrupt the will they won't they aspect. Yeah, true. We've got to keep teasing this as long as possible. Let's, let's get the main objection out of the way when we were watching it, which was we both lost interest in this episode so fast. It should be noted that... This episode has overwhelmingly positive reviews. People absolutely loved this, but I think it's another episode because it's so narrative. But the character doing the voiceover, I find insufferable. Yep. So therefore, he had I had a problem with him keeping my attention because it's the same problem we said about how the ghost stole Christmas is he's telling us how Mulder and Scully are feeling. We're not actually seeing this unfold no. or anything like that. Or, it's just just too heavy-handed. It is. I mean, uh, unfortunately, the, we, the commonality between these two episodes is um, uh, Chris Carter. <laughs> so that's never a good sign. It strikes me as one of these things that probably was very personal to the writers, but that doesn't I mean, relate to idea. the audience. Yeah. Well, yeah, it doesn't mean it's a good idea, and it doesn't mean it relates to the audience. I also think that the plotting of this episode is absolutely just diabolically strange. Because, I mean, we'll follow through a few of these weird bits. So, Bill Paget walks into the FBI building and hands in an unmarked envelope with the Milagro in it. Mm. And says it's to go to Mulder. 
Okay. The people at the desk didn't write Mulder's name on it or say someone has a package for you to pick up. They slid it under his door. That That's weird to begin with. And we, as you mentioned, Scully is seduced into his apartment with... I, what, what, I don't know what that was. But the weirdest bit is then Mulder breaks into the apartment with his gun out and arrests Philip Hatchett. Why did he do that? <laughs> Other than presumably it's written in a novel. Not a flipping clue. No, and I was also realising it when you were sort of laying the ending sequence of the episode. It's uh, I'd actually forgotten that happened at the same time. What Do they find him with his heart in his hands lying on the floor in the furnace room? you got to assume so, yeah. And no one says, well, he's literally holding his own heart because there's no scarring around the chest cavity, and, but his heart's missing, so we presume that's his own heart he's holding. And what? Or as you said as well, like, the heart in the furnace. What was that about? Some kind of weird vision. Yeah, but what did that have to do with anything? I assumed he was throwing away that heart in his room, but... I'm and then he's in the flames, yeah. and then... And then it, the fact he just pulled the heart out at the start of the episode, you're going, it's a sting, I suppose. <laughs> to be fair, I'm not entirely sure we've quite hit on our biblical mythology. Well, in part, I, I really object to the fact that Scully apparently doesn't recognise a Milligro, given it's such a kind of common Catholic icon. Yeah, and she's gone to a Catholic church as well. It's like, Scully, presumably you go here a lot. Well, you literally have Sacred Heart in the name of a lot of churches. The Sacre Coeur in Paris, for example. Is all because of the legend of the Sacred Heart. It's not an obscure concept. No, it's a very common icon. I suppose it might be an obscure concept if you're not a Catholic. But also the same thing. Fair enough, the word Milagro does mean miracle. Why is this episode called that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. If anything, to take the words from uh, Justin Pelle, it feels like the bad sort of miracle. Yes, I think Terry Pratchett had another one as well. Just because the outcome is bad doesn't mean it's miraculous that you know the million to one shot happened. Yeah, which I quite like as the the counterbalance to it all. I think though, and it has been kind of noted in and different various um analyses of this episode. The most interesting thing I feel you can draw for it is the kind of parallel between Paget and Mulder, because in the base level they're both the same kind of characters. However, Paget gives up in the end, yeah. and Mulder kind of keeps on going. So you've got these two idea of two men who are absolutely kind of wedded to their kind of little crusades. But at the eleventh hour, when Padgett realizes he's gonna hurt someone he cares about, he gives up. Mulder would not. That's very true. Mm. At least at this stage, Mulder would give up, wouldn't give up. I mean, I think at some there are a few points where you could point out that he has, though. Mm. I'd say one breath, he was given the opportunity to get back at the people who took Scully, and he declined that choice. Because he wanted to go to a hospital instead. So I don't think it's not beyond the realms of possibility that Mulder could also learn the same lesson. It just doesn't seem to stick quite as often because the writers are quite variable. Mulder has caused surprising amounts of harm to Scully, though. Oh, yeah. Paget barely knows her, but still sacrifices himself essentially to save her. Yeah. I mean, but on that note, though, because we have that discussion between him and the killer. And, uh, you know, the killer helps him realise that the perfect way for his novel to end is for Scully to die. I do feel that without knowing the broad strokes or any other plot of the episode, of the um, novel other than it's the events of this episode, how that's the perfect ending. Because I think we needed to understand why that would be a perfect ending to even get to why he thinks this is a good idea. And then he doesn't want to do it, so he sets about the manuscript. But then he must have typed it out. I mean, actually, one thing I was thought of in the episode is Scully, 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 Scully. Would you like to talk to us about why you were found covered in blood on Mulder's apartment floor, having had a dead Brazilian psychic surgeon trying to gouge your heart out? That you shot five times, the bullet holes are in Mulder's ceiling. Could you please try and explain to us what your experience there? Because I would love to hear this one. I'm just more curious about when Mulder's going to get evicted because this is about the 20th <laughs> shooting in his apartment now. To be fair, only some of them have been him. <laughs> some of them have been other people who live there. If you were a landlord, would you want this trouble? No. Yeah, it's remarkably still there. 
But, I mean, Scully, Scully, what is Scully's excuse for this episode afterwards? She's been important in some other ones with impossible explanations, but this is a one above most of them. Do you want to talk about how Mulder's bedroom exists in a pocket dimension, it seems? The fact that it's round the corner from his door, yet there doesn't look like there should be any space there. No, and it means there's like basically a little, kind of like an alcove just around the corner from his apartment that does is basically useless. And then the Hatch apartment is possibly the mirror to Mulder's, but then also not, because it's also laid out mostly the same. So that's confusing. I read a lot of critiques of this episode, and it's kind of fascinating because it's really one that hasn't withstood the test of time so much we'll say on this of contemporary reviews of this episode were massively positive <laughs> massively complimentary they called it daring they called it a fascinating character study they called it sinister and sympathetic you know all sorts of these kind of positive reviews who people who are really drawn to Paget and this whole story and method of storytelling did we watch the wrong episode yeah, then there's the flip side of the coin, who I must admit I'm on the flip side of the coin for this one. I mean, I'm trying to remember, I don't think, I can't remember if I actually had strong feelings about this episode at all, or just never cared for it. I mean, I think it, it might be like Trevor as in an episode I know is there, but I didn't feel anything about it until trying to rewatch it and went, well, this is, this is very tiresome. Okay, so we had Zach Hendlin... Uh, giving the episode a B minus, he did say the on the whole the episode works, but called it self serious and pompous as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I definitely could see that one. I believe he was also the person in his review who described the episode as being like watching someone's fan fiction, which I thought was a good way of kind of presenting this. You could imagine Paget as the self insert character who'd been put in there. Yeah. The other interesting um, negative reviews I saw about this were criticisms mainly geared at Scully what? in the episode. Uh, no, no, no. It, it, I think it's perfectly justified. Oh, okay. Handlin was one of them again. He said that uh, Scully in this episode has been reduced to a victim waiting to find out which handsome man will rescue her. That's fair. And Paula Vitaris said similar, kind of said that uh, she didn't like it because... It betrayed basically everything we know about Scully up to now, and she's just massively out of character for the entire episode. Yes. But the most interesting one, I felt, was a quote I saw from Elise Ray Herford. She wrote a book called Fantasy Girls, Gender in the New Universe of Science Fiction and Fantasy Television, which she accused the X-Files of reinforcing the stereotype of independent women as lonely, neurotic, and nostalgic for the sexual attraction of men. Ouch, but fair. But yeah, that's kind of what we've seen for Scully over and over now is when you get a writer that wants to just kind of write her as being sex starved, essentially. Yeah. I mean, you kind of, you had it a bit in Gender Bender, you had it in Never Again, you've got it in this one. Well, I think we had a lot in Never Again and Never Again still stands out as the really awkward one where, yeah, the sex scene should have happened and the fact you took it out makes the episode more strange than it is already. Interestingly, it was a criticism that An Gillian Anderson herself had of her character is she felt that Scully was too restrained and needed to loosen up a bit. But there's loosening up and there's Scully, <laughs> as we portray her in this episode, of aroused by autopsies. Yes. And we've, we've forgotten about that tattoo, haven't we? The curse tattoo. Oh, her Ouroboros. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think that ever comes up again, does it? Because I don't think we've ever seen Scully's back since then. No, but we get to see... Jenny Anderson in her underwear for the first time since season one. <laughs> Very true. It felt trifle unnecessary, really. Yeah. And then she gets completely blocked by Mulder. Reality is in the fritz a lot of this episode yeah. because it's unclear how much of it is just in Paget's head. It's inferred quite a lot is just because of that sequence where Mulder can't see him talking to anyone in the yeah. apartment. And I, I do get that to a point, but then you've got Paget's book. E I suppose that's one of the problems as well, is it's not clear if Paget is altering reality by what he's writing, or he simply somehow resurrected this psychic surgeon who is now going off and doing what he's written. Yeah. And again, I feel it's really odd that the psychic surgeon is the killer and is basically superfluous to the episode. I think we need more of a handle on how Paget's power works. It's something supernatural going on there, but we don't know the kind of rules of it how he came to realise he had this power or anything like that. Much like Trevor. Mm. But then I think that's the other point is that 
that kind of revelation would have been good that he thinks he's just writing a novel and sort of I don't know it's him being creepy towards Scully I think I mean really how we can defend him when he's just being an absolute creeper it's the bit where the first time he kind of encounters Scully where he's standing in the lift and with her just staring and at just her. staring and yeah. saying nothing it's like no there's nothing endearing about this it's you're just a creeper yeah and then when he says oh I I imagined you'd come to this church and look I was right what and then I've been talking, I used to live in your area, I couldn't move into your apartment building, so I moved into Mulder's apartment building. Do we, uh... It's completely a tangent, but there is a way to write creeper characters. And my case point in this, because I think it's massively underrated, is the film Creep. Oh, yeah. So the premise of Creep is essentially, well, what the guy tells you, I, I won't spoil the film for you, but he is reportedly a man who has terminal cancer and wants to leave a video kind of journal for his unborn son so he hires a amateur cinematographer to do this for him but when the cinematographer gets to his house the guy keeps kind of behaving increasingly erratically being overly friendly overly personable getting naked when he shouldn't get naked you know that sort of thing and you start to, you start to slowly wonder of you know is this guy well is there something wrong with him is he actually unhinged and dangerous and it just gets increasingly tense from there as this guy he's filming just acts weirder and weirder and you're not sure how much of what he's told you is the truth. Yeah. So that's how you write a creep and make him compelling. Paget's creep lacks <laughs> any kind of subtlety. Yes. And just thinks he's writing high art. Yeah. <laughs> we'd, we've we've been over the fact that, Chris, you kind of wanted to get an actual novelist in to do this. You don't think you can. Because hmm. it's not good. <laughs> Or based on the the Paget voiceover, it's not good. Yeah. I mean, maybe the written prose is better, but I would be surprised. I know I, I've re I've re read some overwritten things before, and it's got that kind of feel to it of you're trying way too hard. This is basically just blotting out the any point you're trying to make. I think it's just. He's just such a terrible writer. <laughs> it, there's one amazing paragraph where he uses the word hegelian uh, and yeah. then <laughs> kind of breaks into soft porn right after it it's like what on earth are you even <laughs> writing man hegelian soft porn i mean what what, what what more do you want other than yeah i thought it's silly to, to have better relationships yeah. or not or no relationship she could be asexual and aromantic we don't mind i'd take that to be honest yeah i mean that actually does correspond to how she's lived her life mostly mm. Like, Mulder is a pervert, but otherwise he's not interested in human relationships either. In so much as they do get jealous of each other on a semi-random basis. Got to admit, and we know it's heading more into the relationship territory now, increasingly by the episode. But I always like the idea of they're just work friends and they work really well together. Yeah, I mean, it would have been good. But I mean, this is a discussion about fandoms and sort of public perceptions of things anyway. I mean, this is... Frasier is the bit, is the example everyone goes to of the thing that kept the will they weren't there going for as long as they could before they had to eventually collapse it. Yeah. And I might much in the X Files starts off with a similar thing of we're just this is this is an aspect of their characters. We're gonna tease it, we're not actually gonna use it for anything. Again, the Avengers is our model of this is a will they weren't there that went on for years. And at the last second when basically it became a they will they, we put a an uh, unavoidable wedge right through the middle of it and stopped it happening. Mm. However, fandom fandom perception, basically it was considered an inevitability from probably midway through season one. True. No one interested in the romantic side of fandoms, I should sort of clarify, has ever doubted this would be an inevitability. Mm. I can't remember. Do we have any more crap silly boyfriends to go through now? Or oh, this God, it? I hope not. Is, is this the last one? I'm trying to think. I just still ship her with Skinner, to be honest. Oh, I know. I'd be a lot more satisfied if Scully and Skinner ended up together. Where is Skinner? Where is Skin Runner? We can have, have more Skin Runner episodes. No, but I think, and I could easily be forgetting something, this is the last one of these terrible ones we're going to have. What, the Not sexy episode. Scully episodes? The sexy, yeah, the sexy Scully episodes. The, the excuse for some form of cheesecake, some form of skin, some form of, hey, Scully is interested in another man. Thank God. <laughs> 
Do we have anything else, or should we desperately try to wake up after slipping into a coma? Yeah, yeah, that might be the idea. The only one thing we didn't touch on in my notes is the weird reference of this episode was the Salinger family. Oh, yeah, well, we did have a brief discussion about Salinger's tombstone. Which I think you found out he doesn't have one. I assumed because we were working on kind of reclusive writers that that was supposed to be a J.D. Salinger reference. But you are absolutely correct. Uh, Salinger doesn't actually have a tombstone. Or at the very least, nobody actually knows what happened to Salinger's body, whether he was buried or cremated, because there's no known marker for him. I mean, this is in keeping with J.D. Salinger. Oh, yeah, it works perfectly. Yeah. I like the idea that one day you might open the closet and just find him, to be honest. <laughs> what is Jonathan Creek? Oh my god, he's been in my closet the entire time. Look, he's still clutching um, Catch and Rye 2, Electric Boogaloo. But yeah, it's following on from our kind of Dick Van Dyke show reference last time with the Petries. Yeah. Diana and Nicholas Salinger were the parents, the late parents of the kids in Party of Five. So, again, it's another reference that doesn't translate very well over to the UK because it's not a show that was very big over here. No, I mean, someone in the guest cast, unfortunately, I didn't actually pay attention to it because I don't know what Party of Five is. Someone someone in our guest cast in one of these two episodes is in Party of Five. Uh, that might be why. So that's why we decided on that particular. But I still think that with our reclusive author, that J.D. Salinger would be the more obvious reference there. Well, yes, but then I'm wondering... Is that indicative of the problems of that these writers are having paying tribute to writers and just, you know, screaming past the point somehow? It was the lingering shot on that grave just made me curious, which is why I looked it up. Just because, you know, it wanted you to notice that. But yeah, you invoke Salinger if you are trying to invoke Salinger and usually Catcher in the Rye specifically. Mm. I mean, we could get into the whole Ghost in the Shell standalone complex, which did... Which was very weird with the Salinger referencing ultimately, because it explicitly references Catching the Rye, but everyone treats it like it's a reference to a different short story. I, I think you've probably got a good argument for the fact that you could reference Catcher in the Rye here, just because Paget's a bit of a Holden Caulfield. Yeah, I could say yeah, I could give you that one. I mean, you even have the scene with Scully in the room is kind of reminiscent of the awkward scene in Catcher of Rye with Caulfield and the prostitute. Yes. So I think you could have built that in quite easily, but no, completely not. It was not supposed to invoke Salinger in any way. So you've got to wonder how much of it is Chris Carter's fault. Like, was Spot and Sasha Band really into J.D. Salinger and put this in there and Chris Carter doesn't know it, so he decided to remove uh, apparently it? Apparently Spotnitz thought it was a J.C. Salinger reference. He didn't realise that either. So we're basically saying this, should, if it's in there and intentional, should Band put it in there and no one paid attention to yeah. it and wrecked the reference. Mm. Oh, my God. On the other hand, I don't trust Shaban as far as I can throw him. No. So yeah, your feelings towards John Shaban have been noted. I suppose that comes back to the, one of those problems of the writing in this episode is that you are, you've written a script about a writer and, and you've decided you've somehow invoked one of the most famous novel or novelists of all times who has weird reclusive mystery in his life because so little is known about it and you've done you apparently turned it into a reference to something else entirely which is in modern pop culture and missed everything you could have done with jd challenger mm. that's maddening i mean it's not even like if there's been in like the aftermath of um john lennon's death you could argue you might try to avoid that because all the comparisons at the time would have been seen in bad taste that's one of the reasons why Catch on the Rye is still very controversial. Exactly. So I can understand why that might make you wary of doing it, but I think 1999... You're far enough removed, you're far enough then. Away. Yeah. It's really bad, isn't it, that you can't talk about Catch on the Rye without dragging John Lennon's death into it. It's just what that guy did. So terrible. Well, you mentioned um, Ghost in the Shell a while ago. That's one of the few times I have seen Holden Caulfield presented positively. Yes. In anything. And I still think the thing that always got me about Ghost in the Shell is you've got the explicit Cash and Rye quote, and they call him the Laughing Man, which, which is, is a different story altogether. It has nothing to do with Catch and Rye, but we're going to keep on going down this route regardless. It is another short story by Salinger, The Laughing Man. It is, but it has no connection to that quote whatsoever. No, you think you would have called him Holden Caulfield, given yeah. that the quote he keeps using is a line said by Holden Caulfield. I know. It's, 
And I think a lot of people don't, people might not realize that, but it's like anyone who's read Catch and Rye goes, wait, why is he called The Laughing Man? That's a short story that no one's read. They've read it. I know you've read it. <laughs> but for the vast majority of people, you've read Catch and the Rye, you haven't read anything else he's ever done. No, Catch and the Rye is a famous one. I, I'd wager a lot of people aren't aware of his short stories. No. And I think the copy you had was a really battered second-hand one because it's not easy to get hold of that, mm. is it? And, I mean, the slight spoilers for Ghost in the Shell, the other kind of neat quirk about the quote as used is it actually explains the person who's doing this, explains exactly who they are, but they overlook it all the time because it can't possibly be that person. Yeah. And that's kind of nice in the end. It's actually Ghost in the Shell. This, this anime series, which has some strange literary referencing, does more with this concept than bloody X-Files. Yeah. Although as we can't be sure the, the Salinger stuff is meant to be in here or not, but it seems odd that you would miss that. It just seems, from a literary standpoint, when you're writing a literary plot, it's a weird thing to overlook. Yeah, it's either overlooking it, if you'd never mentioned, if Salinger hadn't come up at all, you wouldn't think anything of it. You'd think, okay, he's just a pretentious writer mm. but having a near miss by having a Salinger tombstone and it being referencing something else that feels like bloody mindedness maybe like someone said deliberately oh, oh we're doing a Salinger reference oh okay we can't have that we're gonna have to sort of subvert it somehow yeah why <laughs> you may as well just eke out the slim prestige you get from referencing Salinger mm. I don't understand let's get out of it good plan Next week, we have two we've been looking forward to. And Hooray! we really have been looking forward to these ones. Because as much fun as we had with Alpha, we remember liking The Unnatural. Yeah, yeah, I remember liking and it. And we very much remember liking Three of a Kind, which would be Lone Gunman Pilot 2, effectively. It's actually, unusually as well, they're two episodes I remember really well. Yes. So on that basis, I am fairly positive they're going to hold up. In the meantime, if you'd like to get hold of us, our email address is thingsaregettingstrange42 at gmail.com. You can also get us on social media. We are on Twitter and Tumblr, at GetStrange42. We're on Mastodon, at GetStrange42 at universedon.com. And on Facebook, where you can find us by searching for Things Are Getting Strange and X-Files Rewatch Podcast. If you're not sick of my voice by now, I also have a channel on Twitch TV called Adverse Camber 42 and a connected YouTube channel. I stream three times a week, Mondays and Wednesdays at 8pm GMT and Saturdays at 5pm GMT. The game is currently Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc. And also, if you check out the YouTube channel, I am also doing a silent stream over there. It's a little more ad hoc, but it's of the new Final Fantasy game. That's Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. As noted, it's a silent stream, so there's none of my narrative over the top. It's just streaming the game for you. We have a Patreon, patreon.com slash things getting strange where you can find our Let's Play of the first X-Files game, Parts 1 to 4, with Part 5 due in April. We also have our review of Modern Scully by Catatonia, as we try to review pop music and realise we don't really know what we're talking about. But we tried. We tried so hard. Access to everything for as little as $3, and we plan to add to this as we go along with the other video game, the various X-Files novels, sorry, the adult X-Files novels, we should specify, rather than the um, adap adaptations of the episodes. So these are like Goblins, Whirlwind, Ground Zero, Skin? Skin, Antibodies and Ruins. And then the two young adult ones. Agent of Chaos and Devil's Advocate. And then in summer, Perihelion? Perihelion, Perihelion. yep. Coming out in July. Being the sequel to season 11. So a little $3 a month, you'll have access to everything. There are three tiers and little, uh, some small extra perks if you go higher up, but... $3 will get you access to everything. And if you'd like to tell your friends, assuming they like the X-Files, or leave a review, that would be lovely too. Our theme music is Vision by Kevin MacLeod. You can find that on Incompetech.com, licensed under the Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0. Thank you all for listening, and until next time, please remember... I, I want what's mine! mine.